What? Why does it work? There it is. How will I know who I am if I don't have that there? Okay. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I am the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, November 22nd, 2013. Joining me this week, we've got Amy Shira Title from Vintage Space. Hey, Amy. Hello. We've got David Dickinson, a.k.a. Hey, the hey. Astro Guys, the cloudy hey. astronomer. Oh, we're going to get into that in a second. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh. Sweet. And Nancy Atkinson from Universe Today. Hi, everybody. Hey, Nancy. So this week, let me bring this list over here. We've got uh, five active comets visible with binoculars in the night sky. Actually, the morning sky. Um, yes. uh, halting uh, nuclear engines. We've got a zillion launches, and I mean that specifically. One zillion satellites have just been launched. Uh, we've got uh, Inspiration Mars update. High energy jet from the black hole. Uh, 15 years of the International Space Station. Uh, possible NASA cuts and uh, problem of curiosity. So let's get rolling. I, I think let's start specifically with uh, with all of those all of those launches. The biggest one here is Maven. So Amy, why don't you talk about the Maven launch, and then I know David has a whole bunch more as well. Yeah, well, I'm sure. I mean, David and I were both at uh, at LASP in in Boulder, Colorado, yes. this summer at the meeting all the science teams. So, David, free, feel free to jump in because. Were you at the launch today, this week, Amy? No, I couldn't get down. I Is knowing there, the uncertainty of launch windows, I couldn't. There were thousands yeah. of people there, so we really? would have never run. I I didn't see anybody from LASP there. Really? Uh, huh. I knew I a couple people were going down, but no, I watched it. I remembered about five minutes before launch that it was happening, so I did get to NASA TV to watch it and. Um, for a mission that has no visuals, they did a really great job of having sort of a, um, a sort of animation of what was happening during the whole launch phase. Um, and it was, from what I, I heard, I don't know if anything has come up after, but it was a flawless launch. Um, everything seemed to happen pretty much on time. They started right at the opening of the launch window, um, which means that they are on track to get to Mars. I think September 22nd, 2014 is the, the estimated date that they're going to go into orbit. Um, and it's a really cool mission, and I don't just say that because I spent time with part of the science team and think they're awesome. Um, MAVEN is basically going to look at Mars' atmosphere and sort of reverse engineer what happened to the planet, um, why it sort of became this cold, dry, more or less atmosphereless world that we see. Um, so I think my favorite, my favorite analogy for this, oh there, we've got Fraser showing the launch here. Um, my favorite analogy of what MAVEN is going to do is that um, if Mars is a pot of boiling water, you are, Maven is effectively going to scoop up a little bit of the steam and try to figure out how much water was in the pot before it was boiling. That's yeah. kind of neat. <laughs> we we had a we had a low deck cloud deck as seen from the causeway, so unfortunately we saw the launch for about twenty seconds before it vanished into the clouds. But it was still kind of cool oh, to see. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those launches yeah, like thing... there it is. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> well, it popped off the the launch pad pretty quickly. Yeah. I don't oh know. yeah, it did. I've so we're sort of used to watching old Saturn V launches, so anything that's smaller than that just seems to just rocket right up, quite literally yeah. rocket right up. But, What's yeah. the launch vehicle? It was an Atlas V. It was an Atlas V. Yeah. But oh. with no external boosters, it's just a straight up. No, it went a 401 yeah. configuration. I, yeah. I actually thought it was. It took a long time to get going, but that's kind of an Atlas V thing. I mean, I remember mm. I was at the SDO launch, yeah. and same thing. It just like, okay, are you going? You going? Yep, yep, good. Yeah, they're they're a little slower moving than the the Falcon rockets. Or this the last launch yeah. I saw was a Falcon Nine, and that went really quick. The small ones go really quick. Or like the Minotaur launch Tuesday night, that went really quick. I haven't Solar actually rocket. seen a video yeah. of that. Yeah, yeah, that was. Fraser, do you have that queued up to to show? <laughs> what do you want to see? The Minotaur there was, launch. There was a Minotaur, Minotaur launch Tuesday night. Yeah, yeah give there was me a second. Launch at a at a Wallops. We, we've had a we've had a launch every day this week from somewhere in the world. There was a Minotaur launch with the CubeSats on Tuesday. Uh, the Chinese did an unannounced, but it was a classified launch. So there was no video of it. Uh, they, they did a military launch Wednesday. And there was an ICBM launch with more CubeSats on Thursday from Russia. And there was a swarm launch this morning. I've had a hard time keeping up with all these. As a matter of yeah, so how, how so many CubeSats is that in a week now? I think well, we're at <laughs> Tuesday was 29. Plus, 29 plus there was a larger sat on there, yeah. Yeah. And the, the Dnipro launch from Dombrowski on Thursday 
32. 32. Yeah, I yep. thought it was funny because they broke the record for the number of payloads Tuesday, then they broke it again on Thursday. That's really so the, funny because I wrote the article on Tuesday about the record of 29 satellites. Yeah, it, it <laughs> so only, there was, what, 60 satellites launched in the last week? Wow. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, on space track, trying to, it's nuts to try to keep track of all these NORAD IDs. A lot of us sat trackers were always like trying to assign what ID goes to what payload, and it's just been nuts this week because the numbers have been hopping up so quick. But these CubeSats are so small. I mean, a lot. some of these CubeSats yeah. are just like you could hold them in your hand. Yeah. They're just like mm -hmm. this big. Yeah, you're, you're, uh, you're not going to track them with binoculars or naked eye. They're too, <laughs> they're too tiny to see. But, well, uh, you'll what? Those oh, were bad. No. <laughs> Amy, please gonna, talk. I was going to say that, that um, I mean, from, from looking at some of the, I, w I looked through at the 29 at NASA launch, and a lot of them are sort of proof of concept or proof of technology or just kind of testing a specific kind of fuel cell, how it handles being in sort of an exposed solar environment. So, um, yeah, it's not surprising that, you know, A, you could get so many of them on a launch vehicle, but they're, they're so small because they're all these tiny little, like, individual test beds. Um, so it's and unclear, yeah. One of them was done by a high school group, uh, the one that was on the Minotaur uh, launch. It was the first ever high school built and launched satellite. Well, they, they hitched a ride on the Minotaur, but it was, uh, it was totally built and conceived by a high school group. That was kind yeah, of I mean, cool. these CubeSats, this is a great innovation in satellite technology because the price of these CubeSats to develop them is, is very low. I mean, you know, it's a lot of it's off-the-shelf type stuff. A lot of universities and research groups can can build these things. As you said, high school students, at university I mean, students are able to build these things. They're using these phone sats. They're the same Android operating technology that we have on our yeah. cell phones so that a lot of us have. Yeah, and so in many cases you want some kind of space-hardened gear, memory modules, uh, processors, cameras and stuff that, that's a little more hardened for space, but it, it's not that bad. And so then the big price is, of course, the launch technology, the, the price of the launch. But in this case, you know, they're launching these things on, on old ICBMs or, yeah. some, you know, or they're just grouping them all up to 29 at the same time, right? The, and, those Dnipir rocket launches out of Dombrowski Air Base are kind of cool to watch because they are ICBMs. And they literally, it looks like a jack-in-the-box launch when they come up because they're coming out of the ground silos. So those are kind of, they're kind of nifty. I wish it, it was like 1 a.m. in the morning here, so I didn't stay up to watch it. But it, they're, they're kind of nifty to watch. That is the best use of <laughs> nice old nuclear missiles because everyone knows you're watching a, a uh, sword get hammered into in, a plow chair in, right in there. In the, the Minotaur V that went out of wallops with Laddie, that's, those are old ICBMs too. That's what they're, they're just repurposed. Yeah. yeah, so the the Minotaurs and the and the Russian versions of this, this is great. Just keep them yeah. coming. Just yeah. more. Every one of those is one less nuclear missile that could kill us all. <laughs> I think yeah, it's less, fantastic. less war, more space exploration. <laughs> I think it was Carl Sagan that said space is the best use of nukes that he could think of. It was something along that line. Well, I was doing an interview, and this will probably come out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I was talking to Dr. Kevin Grazier, and he was saying that while uh, asteroids are bad for hitting with nuclear missiles, in fact, you might either it'll just bounce right off. Comets actually are an effective target for nuclear missiles because interesting, yeah, because you'll get the you know you'll get you'll blow away all of the 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 water to, to let right? Bruce Willis know that. So. Yeah, yeah. So that's <laughs> but, that would that might work. To what end? Just make it less bad if it's going to hit you. Right. Right. So, so shooting nukes at a, at an asteroid, at a rock or metal asteroid, yeah. is, a, is a total waste of time. But shooting right, at a comet might right. actually be effective. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, but this. <laughs> speaking of comets, there yes, are there five are five visible comets in the morning sky right now, right? Yeah, there there are five comets that are binoculars. They're they're uh, in binocular range. I, I consider binocular range tenth magnitude, positive tenth magnitude, or brighter. And we had four, because, of course, we're tracking Ison right now. Uh, we had R1 Lovejoy, which is very well placed right now uh, for observation. I've seen that one. That's about eighth magnitude. I think it's actually around sixth magnitude right now. X1 Linear brightened up uh, recently. We had Comet Enki until we lost it in the morning uh, sun, uh, early dawn. And now we have Comet C2013 V3 Nevetsky. This was just discovered earlier this month. And if that name sounds familiar... Uh, Ivan Nevetsky is uh, one part of the team that discovered Ison last year, uh, along with uh, Novichok. Novichok was the name of the other Russian astronomer that discovered 
uh, Comet Ison last year. Now this comet was about 14th magnitude when they discovered it earlier this month, which really it wasn't scheduled to be anything interesting until it brightened up about 250 times uh, this early last weekend. Now it's in the 8.8 .8 magnitude range is what I'm seeing from other observers. I have not got to see this one myself because I've been clouded out all week, but uh, it's it's a uh, it's in the constellation Leo right now, so we're actually getting quite a little train of comets. I'm seeing a lot of good photos of R1 Lovejoy. Uh, we're seeing good photos of Ison until it's starting to get into that sunlight, twilight region in the early uh, dawn sky where you're not really being able to see it right now. But, but yeah, I'm hoping for a clear morning here sometime this weekend. I, I have my alarm set for 5 a.m. every morning. Uh, my my uh, MO is I get up, I look out, see if it's clear, and if it's not clear, I go back to bed for an hour, and if it's clear, I get up and start observing. So I've been getting more sleep, but I oh, really would, oh, no. I'd prefer, I would prefer to be observing comets than sleeping, actually. So. Yeah, it's been clear and cold here, but I, I haven't uh, done any observing yet. So. Yeah, and these comets are just starting to enter the range of, I know the stereo spacecraft are starting to image Enki, and Ison, and next week they're going to start getting in the range of uh, Soho spacecraft and their Lasco C3 camera, and SDO will probably be where we're all going to be next uh, Thursday on Thanksgiving after Turkey. We'll all be there watching to see the big story is if Ison survives perihelion or not. So It's uh, the 28th, right? We're only now yes. a week away. We're, we're within a week right now, so it's going to enter into field of view of Soho and then SDO, and that's probably going to be our, our key eyeball right there. There was a mission out of um, White Sands, I forget the name of it now, Fortis, that's the name of it, that was supposed to observe ice in this week. I've been kind of watching to see if there's any updates on that. It was a suborbital launch that was supposed to watch ice and for, like, do a six-minute observation with the suborbital. I'm, I'm amazed the suborbital rocket can even aim and point to observe anything, but that's kind of cool they can do that, so... Uh, I haven't heard any information out of that, but that may give us some more updates on what ISIN is doing right now. Now, I had seen some images that people thought that maybe ISIN was starting to break up a bit and flare. What do you? I, do I you keep hearing, do? I keep hearing that, but I haven't heard anything really substantial. I keep hearing stories about ISIN breaking up. Uh, this this would be a bad time for it. If it broke up now, uh, we may lose it after perihelion. Uh, and it's interesting, a lot of magazines that have a lot of lead time, like Astronomy and Sky and Telescope, they've already written and published their December and January even issues are on the newsstand, so they have to really be speculative as far as what they think Ison's going to do, because they already have all their stuff out there on the newsstand right now saying, you know, whether Ison is great or Ison fizzled or whatever. So, well, as yeah. you remember, we did a, a special, we participated in, in this Discovery Channel special about yes. three weeks ago, and same kind of thing, like, like they're putting a lot of energy and effort and hope into into ice and brightening becoming the comet of the century that we're expecting. And uh, You know, a breakup right around perihelion might be interesting, though. If it did it right around perihelion, um, we could end up kind of like the uh, Comet Lovejoy, W3 Lovejoy a few years ago, where we have that headless comet kind of heading out, or a string of comets heading out, and that, that would be cool, too. No, uh, earlier in, this... Oh, go ahead, earlier, earlier this week, uh, one of the Max Planck observatories... Uh, put out an image that they took, and they said that it kind of had sprouted wings and that kind of thing. But I was kind of keeping track on things on the on the Comet uh, user group, and a lot of people were saying, "Oh, we're not seeing that." And so, uh, so I kind of held off publishing on that because there there was a lot of people saying that they weren't seeing that. But uh, I did see a picture from Joseph Bermacombe. Um I think he put it out yesterday, and there was like a. Um, Kind of a shooter, <laughs> or yeah. just a, a piece that was uh, separate. So, um, so you know, maybe he did capture a piece that maybe was I coming off there. I follow that same Yahoo group. Yeah, it's it's a it's a pretty good group of uh, pretty knowledgeable people. Uh, right. One thing I want I wanted to mention because, uh, and I kind of headed it off because I knew it was going to become an issue when I wrote this post on Five Comets, but it's already out there around the internet. Is uh, None of these comets are related. They're all on different orbits. Because the first thing people always ask me is like, well, are we suddenly seeing a lot of, com is there like a, a comet storm heading into the inner solar system or are these comets heading to us? Uh, Enki has been well known for over a century. Uh, Ison we've known about for a year. Uh, Lovejoy is on a 7,000 year orbit. Uh, this current one, Nevetsky, is a very tiny comet and it's on a Halley type orbit, I think on uh, 30 years, I believe it is. But these are all, in, and we've had years, remember when we had Hale Bop and Hayu Kutaki, when those came by, those were like within six months. Here's we've Joseph's had, picture, by the way. 
Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. And back in 1910, we had the Great Comet of 1910 and Halley's Comet come by within very quick succession. So it's it's kind of just a coincidence right now that we're having this this uh, this lineup of morning comets that seem to be in the same direction, but they're on drastically different orbits. That's great. So That's really going to settle down the uh, conspiracy people. <laughs> it isn't the clear evidence of the world ending that we've all been waiting for. Yeah. 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 Okay, all right, well, let's move on. Uh, so now I would like to talk about the fact that the International Space Station has been around for 15 years, Nancy. Yeah, yeah, 15 years, kind of a, a, a big milestone there. Yeah, so 15 years ago this week, uh, the Russians launched the Zarya module, and then um, uh, just a couple weeks later, then the U.S. launched up their first node, so they um, hooked the two pieces together and... Uh, they actually had uh, Bob Cabana from NASA and Sergey Krikalev from uh, from the um, Russian Space Agency go in together. So it was kind of a symbolic thing. But uh, yeah, so um, 15 years and we've had, so that was in 1998 and then just two years later in 2000 is when the first expedition crew went up there and so since that time we've had continuous human presence up there which is pretty impressive actually. So. Yeah, that's uh, almost thir yeah, 13 years that we've had uh, continuous human presence in space. And so when I started Universe Today and started reporting on, on the space station, like I started it in 1999, in, the, in March of 1999, and it had been up for three, four months. And yeah. so when I was first reporting on the space station, it was just the two modules together. And then as yes, we reported on every piece yes. from that point on. Yeah. It's amazing to think 13 years ago what we were doing, even technology-wise, and the, the Internet was just kind of a baby then. So. Yeah, and what, what's kind of cool to think about is just how little problems they've had. You know, the, all the pieces that have been built from different contractors around the world have all fit together perfectly. And, um, you know, they've had some minor problems, like the uh, uh, there was an issue with the solar array, and they got that fixed, and they're at the... Um, uh, what are they called, the SARGE, the things that actually turns the solar arrays, and they figured out um, how they could work around the problem with that. Um, I mean, they've had some computer issues and some fire alarms that go off, you know, by themselves without any issues. So, um, you know, I, I think 13 years of uh, of hardly any pro or 15 years of hardly any problems is, is pretty remarkable, especially for, a, you know, an international consortium like that. It's, um, I think it's remarkable. Not a uh, colossally expensive boondoggle. No, no, and no. and now I mean, so I wrote an article uh, probably um, three, four, five years ago, uh, explaining why I loved the International Space Station. It was I heart the ISS, and uh, I'm I'm working on a new one now because one of my points in that article a few years ago was that. Um, you know, it's it's set for science. We're getting ready to have some science coming out of the station, and now um, we've actually got a lot of science coming out. And so, my new article is going to focus on uh, on you know ten reasons, ten scientific reasons to love the International Space Station, because they do have some really great uh, medical findings. Um, and of course, there's the uh, alpha magnetic spectrometer. Um, that had some uh, big uh, big release earlier this year, although there's, there's some debate about that. But um, yeah, I think it's just uh, it's it's ripe for for more discoveries coming out of there. They launched satellites by throwing them out the window. Yeah, that too. <laughs> they did that this week again too. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I know it, Nancy, you are the shamelessly our our biggest uh, International Space Station fan, and, and yeah. dig up her her old article. There's one other thing, Nancy, which is that it's been nine years since you've been writing articles for Universe Today. Yeah, wow. just on on Sunday cool. was the the anniversary of the first article I wrote for Universe Today, which I I couldn't believe that Fraser gave me this assignment. It was interviewing uh, astronaut Jeffrey Hoffman. He was working on a new uh, a way to uh, deal with um, uh, radiation in space and how to protect spacecraft. And uh, they had this idea for a uh, superconducting magnet to uh, create a kind of a bubble around the spacecraft. Ultimately, their their research didn't pan out, but uh, it was really interesting, and I know it uh, it garnered a lot of discussion. So it was it was really fun, and I got to follow up with him later on. And uh, yeah, it was it was great and. Writing for Universe Today has been great, so 
I feel pretty lucky. <laughs> Yay. Me too. Aw, group hug, everybody. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, well, let's move on. Enough of this uh, nostalgia. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about, uh, Dave, let's talk about uh, NASA halting their new nuclear engine. Come on. Yeah, this, this was kind of troubling news came out this past weekend uh, that they're going to shelve uh, construction of their flight-ready, what's called uh, ASRG, is Advanced Sterling Radio Toss... Radio, radio. So you need to do this again. Do you need to take a break? Yeah. No. <laughs> there. Anyway, their plutonium-powered ASRGs are going flight-ready ASRGs are going to be shelved for now. Uh, they're still going to do the uh, research and development over to the. Uh, they're going to transfer it over to the Glenn uh, NASA Glenn Research Center. But it's kind of troubling because these generators were supposed to take use of what very little plutonium NASA has right now. They're about four times as radio efficient as the MMRTGs that uh, NASA is currently using, like on MSL and New Horizons and Cassini and all these spacecraft that are out in the outer solar system. They basically need RTGs to operate because you can't use solar power out there. Juno will be the first spacecraft to go to Jupiter and use solar power, but it needs these gigantic solar power panels to do it out there. And even then, they have all kinds of constraints with Juno, like it can't get too close to the Io Jupiter, Jupiter uh, flux tubes right now because of the, the radiation, and they have to be on a far out orbit, and any kind of micrometeoroids could end that mission out there, any kind of dust or debris. So it's kind of troubling. NASA began, there was a plutonium shortage. Uh, NASA, uh, the government and DOE start, uh, DOD stopped making plutonium in 1989, and we were running uh, up against a shortage until this year when they started restarted production, and eventually when they get ramped up, the production process is kind of slow. They're looking at making 1 to 1.5 kilograms of plutonium per year eventually once they uh, get the whole process ramped up. But say a spacecraft like New Horizons uses 11 kilograms of plutonium for its MMRTG. That means that with these current uh, RTGs that we're using in the production rates that we're probably going to see, if you read the writing on the wall with the current productions and going with the old technology, we're going to see one to two outer solar system missions per decade. We've kind of been keeping at that pace right now. If you think about MSL was RTG powered, that went off two years ago. New Horizons went off 2006, that was RTG powered. Cassini before that in 1999. But, uh, you know, they were going to make these uh, these ASRGs in order to take advantage of, you could have more of these small discovery class missions. You could have four discovery class missions for the amount of plutonium it would take to do one big Battlestar Galactica type mission out there, you know, one big Cassini type mission. So it's unfortunate they're still going to do uh, do the research and development on this, but the two R ASRGs they're going to make for 2016, those are shelved right now. So it's it's uh, it's kind of troubling, uh, and it's kind of unclear how much research and development they're going to do at the Glenn Research Center with this. I was talking to Casey Dreyer at Planetary Society when I wrote this article, and it's it's uh, it's part of that whole grim story of basically NASA doesn't have the money to do as much as NASA would like to do right now. This is really troubling. Uh, you yes. know, these these RTGs are are just the best way to power these these missions. Yeah, if you, if can you see look at what's Voyager 2 is still going. Yeah, Voyager 2 is still going. The the pioneers are still. I don't know if they're still yeah. going. No, they, um, they, the pioneers are silent. Cassini, yeah. Curiosity, and Curiosity yeah. is a great example. I mean, we look at the the power problems that Spirit and Opportunity have had. Curiosity is not going to have any of these power problems. It's got tons of power, and it has nothing holding it back, and it's going to go for, you know, hopefully yeah, for years and years and years. The and ha the half half life of plutonium is right around where you get half the amount of energy out of it when it, from radioactive decay is a, is in the about seventy years. So we we could have uh, Curiosity could keep going for a couple decades. Yeah, and you've got New Horizons. Which, that could go uh, for 50 years, too. It's yeah, which is going to just be able to go past uh, icy object. You know, After it finishes this flyby of Pluto, you can imagine going after icy object after icy object and just making all kinds of amazing discoveries. And the fact that they're, they, they're running out of these this plutonium for these RTGs is a, is a really big yeah. problem, and it's too it's, bad because it sort of shuts down and really compromises a whole class of type of exploration that you, that is very good. And, uh, you know, something... 
Go ahead. Something, yeah. I learned, something I learned from the MSL tweet up when I went for the launch is uh, that I didn't know is the plutonium for uh, MSL came from the Russians. They actually bought that off the Russians. And there are some other sources out there that they're trying to procure some more plutonium from, from various places. I always thought it was kind of interesting, and I don't know. I think they would have to reblend it from when I was talking to somebody at Sandia Laboratory. There are a few accidents that they've had over the years with uh, RTGs um, that they could possibly go after. There's an RTG at the bottom of the Marianas Trench from Apollo 13. They don't tell you that in the movie. Uh, from It was supposed to be at one of the ALSEP experiments on the moon when they jettisoned the Aquarius limb and, uh, and uh, put it into the Pacific Ocean. It had a nuclear RTG on board. That was one of the reasons they put it in the deepest part of the ocean they could think of. But uh, it's, it's never, they've done searches for it and they've never been able to find it. There's never been any radio, uh, radioactive uh, contamination that they've detected. But I always wondered if they could go after that and repurpose it again. Uh, yeah, that, that would be an interesting mission, wouldn't it? Uh, here, I've got one little thing here. Richard Drum uh, our good friend Richard Drum put together, did get a, a copy, uh, a video of the launch of, was this the Laddie launch? A miniature launch. Oh, cool. Yeah, so that's just sort of what a miniature launch looks like. Wow. Yeah, a lot of people saw it. It was a good night launch right up the east Yeah, coast. that was the Laddie launch, so he was knowing that we could use that. Oh, one minor thing I wanted to say about the ASRGs. Uh, they were saying that there may be some more clarification coming out of the American Geophysical Union fall meeting here in a few weeks, so I expect I'll probably be writing about this again in December. Now, there are sort of larger NASA budget problems, and uh, Nancy, you have some information on this? I do. <laughs> uh, um... Did I segue too fast there? We were talking about... I, I know they were talking about possibly pulling the plug on Cassini next year. As Elizabeth Howell wrote about that on Universe yeah. Today. But. Yeah, Elizabeth wrote about that. and so. Um... What do you have on that, David? Well, I know it would be kind of sad if they... I, I kind of read that and linked to it in conjunction to the SRG article about them stopping that uh, production of those units because Cassini is uh, plutonium-powered as well. And they're talking about they may not have enough money to keep tracking and operating all these missions. Cassini was scheduled to end in 2017. They're going to deorbit it, kind of like they did with Galileo, uh, where they deorbited it into Jupiter. Yeah. Uh, they were going to deorbit Cassini into Saturn, and that was one mission I know they had talked about. That it's among others she was mentioning that they may have to stop uh, monitoring and tracking, which is kind of a shame because it it, uh, it took us uh, several years to get Cassini out there over a decade if you count from research and development to getting it to the launch pad. Uh, it's the only spacecraft that's ever orbited Saturn. It's turning out all these awesome images. And you never know when something happens, like uh, a comet shoemaker Levy 9 that hit Jupiter. It was cool that we had some eyeballs out there uh, to look at. You never know when something surreptitious like that's going to happen. And, it, you know, it's handy to have eyeballs at different areas in the solar system to watch these things. So And, you know, last week we... we talked all about the big photo that Cassini had taken of Earth and everyone was included in that image. And I think the Cassini's done a really good job. The Cassini team, Cor Carolyn Porco and the rest of the uh, of the Cyclops team, has done a really good job of, of keeping Cassini in everyone's mind and making sure that we're all aware of it. And I think that's going to that's going to really help it out if that decision comes down. It's the same thing as the Hubble Space Telescope. I mean, people have threatened to cancel the Hubble Space Telescope in the, in the past. But, boy, look at those pictures. How could you, you know, it's like, I don't know, it's like there, there was kicking some talk a puppy, about, you know? There was some talk in the article about uh, cuts for manned space flight and cuts like for what they're doing with the ISS right now. And I, I know the Russians had said before, if, if we don't want the ISS, they would take it over. Uh, so, which would be kind of strange, but... Yeah, yeah. Elizabeth wrote that uh, uh, it was from the Congressional Budget Office that looks at kind of all the possibilities for spending, and they one of their proposals was to cut the uh, human spaceflight program. But uh, I guess this is something that they bring up occasionally, so uh, it's it's nothing new. And then, like you mentioned, David, um, they are right now NASA's um, they've got four potential um, commercial crew transportation. Uh, companies and uh, uh, a press release that they put out earlier this week indicated that they would uh, consider having more than one, perhaps two or three, and then uh, one idea from this uh, 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 proposal put out by the Congressional Budget Office was just to have only one commercial crew partner. So, 
Um, you know, that, that's, that's disappointing. I think the uh, having multiple commercial crew would, would really be great. Yeah. As far as, uh, you know, having, you having better possibilities of what's going to happen. Competition, yeah, you always think competition is supposed to drive free market, so. All right. You know, I gotta say, when I when I visited the SpaceX facility uh, a couple of weeks ago, and you see the stuff that they're working on, and the 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 gimbal motors, and the innovation that's happening, even if there's problems with the budget in the short term and a lot of missions, you know, these are really holdovers from older budgets and older methods and inter international cooperation and so on. But there's a whole new generation of aerospace firms and launch methods and providers and stuff that I think is going to is going to keep the system going so I wouldn't see these kind of budget crises as any indication of what the future of space flight is going to look like if anything it's it's brighter than ever uh, well you know what speaking of uh, new space uh, Amy well let's uh, you reported on inspiration Mars uh, yeah. <laughs> looking for help <laughs> yes yes uh, maybe not the horse to bet on if you want to go to Mars. Um, so Inspiration Mars, just for anybody who doesn't know or doesn't remember which one it is, because I always get it mixed up with Mars One in my head as crazy Mars things. Um, Inspiration Mars is uh, Dennis Tito's initiative. It's The idea is to send a married couple on a, a free return trajectory flyby of Mars. Um, it would be a 501 day mission and the ideal launch date I think it's like December 27th, 2017 to January 5th, 2018, um, which gives you the shortest transit time. Um, and he really wants to do this. And in the press conference in, I think it was in February, I remember watching it, um, everybody was very, you know, really like harping on the inspiration bit and talking about how this is a mission for America and how it's going to, you know, reinvigorate everyone into space exploration. And, and it's going to happen because Dennis Tito having millions upon millions of dollars, it has funded the first two years of the program. Um, so what that what that actually is, is he, he said that he would give about 300 million of his own money to the program. But the mission is going to cost, the, their estimate is about uh, a billion. So that other 700 million, turns out it's not as easy to get from, uh, you know, crowdfunding or private investors or corporate sponsorship for, I'm not sure what the return it would be on that, but, um, so he's, he's asked uh, at a, a house committee meeting, I don't, I never remember what the house government stuff is here, America, um, <laughs> he publicly has, has asked um, NASA to take the reins of this mission and basically give him the extra $700 million that he needs, um, and the issue behind all this is that the mission that he designed was supposed to be basically like, you launch to Mars and you let Newton do the driving and basically, you know, physics takes care of it. But it turns out that the mission can't be that simple. It's a lot more complicated and he needs the technology that NASA is developing. Um, the SLS has an upper stage that would be needed to launch a spacecraft that heavy to keep two people alive for 501 days with all the emergencies and everything. Um, he needs that to launch a spacecraft that heavy to Mars. He needs um, some of the technology that they're developing for Orion, which is built with long duration mission and very fast uh, re-entry, um, surviving very fast re-entries. Um, he needs that technology. So the, the sort of the thing is, you know, hey NASA, I need your technology, so you fund the mission, and any mission, any technology you develop in getting my mission off the ground, you get to keep. Um, so yeah, having we've just talked about how much NASA has no money right now, um, <laughs> and that's, I mean, seven hundred million is a lot of money, <laughs> and that is not extra money that NASA has just kicking around. And I think the real issue with this is that. Um, 2018 is not that far away, and if you get some program off the ground, it's going to be a crash program, and crash programs generally don't develop really solid long-term technology that you can apply to greater things. I mean, this is, um, and they, they keep talking about how Apollo 8 was so inspirational because it went around the moon. Well, Apollo was a crash program, and it didn't leave us with technology that was broadly applicable to other missions. So let's look at the history and not repeat the fact. <laughs> um, you know, doing, doing that mission again for, you know, scientific return that you could get with an unmanned mission for inspiration's sake doesn't seem like something that NASA would sort of shelve everything else to do. Um, it doesn't, I, I don't think there's a reason to do. Um, 
I, I, I'm a firm believer in taking very like measured steps to these things to develop technology that can go to multiple programs, be they manned, unmanned, Mars, Venus, whatever, wherever you want to go visit with whatever. Why um, do you hate sending people to Mars, Amy? I don't hate sending people to Mars. I don't like crash programs. All right. They don't end well. It's just going to, yeah. <laughs> just, just look just at the name. I <laughs> know. But I mean, you uh, can, I mean not this mission... But, I mean, this mission was it was sort of like um, the Apollo 8 mission, right? That you'd send a, you send the astronauts, they go around the, the moon, yeah. and they would return, yeah. and and look at the moon with their own eyeballs, I guess. And in this case, it would be Mars, right? You they do a flyby of Mars, they would look out the window, and go, "Yep, that's yep. Mars," <laughs> and then they uh, would come home. I think I think my issue with that and that analogy is that Apollo 8 wasn't launched because it was like, let's keep everyone inspired as we go to the moon, it was, okay, we don't have a lunar module that can fly yet, and we have this Block 2 Apollo command module that we know is fl is flightworthy, and we don't know a lot about the lunar environment, and we need to test the main SPS, the Service Propulsion System engine, so let's not waste time, let's do this, and cross all of these steps off of our list in going to the moon. So it was, I mean, Apollo is a crash program, but it was a very structured crash program. Um, this Inspiration Mars, as it's designed, unless there's been some change that I haven't seen yet, is not taking a step towards another goal. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been... And I that, really that, feel... that's why I don't like that, that analogy. It's sort of taking the good thing, like the sort of, you know, the Earthrise wonder of Apollo 8 that we remember and taking it out of the context of everything else that it was a part of. There's my yeah. rant. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I, went, I went and asked my wife, and she said no, so... No, you can't go. All right. <laughs> no, it was, she. She would, which is too bad because we backpacked around the world together. So I thought, you know, we we would probably be able to put up with each other for a 500 plus day mission. So, right. but <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think building on what Amy's saying, and I had a rant about this on my video channel, which is that I really think the most sustainable long term way to do this human space exploration is to just keep setting the bar higher and higher and higher, one incremental step at a time. Build a you know a good technology platform, and then send up like like why we've done an orbit of the moon but we haven't done an orbit of an asteroid so that that yeah. was that would probably be easier than going all the way to mars let's do a let's do a return mission around an asteroid let's do a return mission to a lagrange point let's you know let's just build just keep building the capabilities now let's send three people now let's send five people now let's you know and just keep that whole process going step after step after step well, it's it's, uh, it's 20 it's 2014 here in a few weeks so his window of having something on the pad is kind of closing in, in a year or two, really. Yeah, and, kind of and he's got the, the secondary launch window in, um, I think, 2021. I can't remember what the dates are, but um, it would be an 89-day longer mission, but still <laughs> could work. So well, he's kind of gunning for that as his if, second if choice, they, but... If they do it, they'll break they'll break the human spaceflight yeah. endurance record easily. <laughs> yeah. I think by 100 days if they do it. Yeah. yeah. So I'm all for an orbital mission. I think what would be really cool would be to have a crew in orbit around Mars controlling a rover in real time. I mean, there you go. That would yeah. be really cool, and then we could do that. Before, you know, well, we keep working on figuring out how to land a big enough payload. But you know, Probably whipping around only... the far side is sort of like going a really long way for not a lot. The, the yeah. only science you'll get is just the human physiology aspect of what does a flight to yeah. Mars do to people. After yeah. Winning. No, you'll get a ton of stuff, right? You're gonna get the you're gonna get the, the human physiology. You're gonna be like radiation shielding. You're gonna be working yeah. out. Uh, you know, you won't all you won't be handling is is entry and landing. Yeah. But you're gonna get every other part of the mission about just as you said the human physiology stuff. How do you keep these people alive? The you know what kinds of flight trajectories are appropriate? Yeah. Um, it's, it's worth doing, and it's and it probably will be the first mission. Will probably be a flyby, probably a human flyby, or maybe just a cheese flyby, like what they did with the Dragon <laughs> Capsule, what SpaceX did with the Dragon Capsule. Yep. A you almost think that flyby. Oh yeah. yeah. The first, uh, the first when the Dragon Capsule went up, they they put uh, a human beings worth oh. of cheese, big Rough. block of cheese, into the spacecraft. I think, I think took it, that I, to orbit. I think it would be tantalizing to see Mars in the window and not being able to stop. It's just it's like, there it goes. It's yeah, like, we're going to get that yeah. with New Horizons when, uh, when New Horizons yeah. gets past Pluto. Yeah, yeah. it's just going to whiz by. Like, yep, there it is. Okay. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, okay, so uh, let's talk about some problems that Curiosity is having. Nancy. Yeah, uh, recently the uh, uh, Curiosity team reported that there was what they called a soft short on the Curiosity uh, rover. Uh, a, a hard short would be something like two wires coming in contact with each other and really kind of being a mission ending thing, but uh, soft short was just kind of a, uh, a reduction in the amount of electricity that's available. So uh, and actually, right, you know, Curiosity did not did not go like into safe mode or anything like that. It was just something that they noticed in the data that they get back from the rover, and so um, there's a reduction in the amount of power that's available. But they're doing some troubleshooting, and uh, the rover is actually still um, working, but at a reduced pace. And um, uh, you know, there was no reboot or anything, but I think they're looking at it. Uh, this has happened before. It happened right after um, Curiosity landed, where there was this kind of um, drop in power, and they thought that was from the, you know, the kind of the explosive bolts where it came down off of the the hovering hover hover lander thing, and uh, and then I think they actually had this happen before uh, since then. Um, but um, this one, I think they're a little more concerned about because it's kind of a repetitive thing, and so they want to look into it and make sure that they understand what's going on. Um, so uh, uh, that would be something to keep an eye on because uh, you know a, a hard short would would not be good. Yeah, all this talk about this wonderful RTG generator on the Curiosity, <laughs> and if it gets yeah, a hard short, this yeah, don't don't, this week. yeah. It's got it two. To do this. It's got two RTGs on it, so. So if one goes, yeah. Got a backup. Uh, okay, so and then then I think the last story we got this week, Nancy, is that there's a high energy jet coming from our black hole. Yeah, yeah, we've uh, really not seen that before, and and while the kind of the common idea of black holes is that they suck and kind of vacuum up everything in the vicinity with uh, that stuff never to be seen again. That's not always true because there's um, uh, it, it'll kind of a lot of black holes will kind of burp out um, for some reason burp out stuff that it doesn't want in in the form of high energy jets. And uh, astronomers have seen uh, jets like this around lots of supermassive black holes but in other galaxies not really from ours. They've seen uh, kind of indications that maybe there was one at one time. They c called it a ghost of a past jet. Uh, maybe um, they were thinking that they saw it. Uh, but uh, now they have kind of what they're calling their best evidence that the uh, uh, Sagittarius A star does have a jet and it's only one. A lot of times these things come in pairs. But um, they didn't actually see the jet itself, but uh, with the Chander X-ray Observatory they actually saw um, some some x-rays. It appears like the jet is shooting into some gas and so they could see some x-rays coming off from that gas and it kind of was pointing back to to the black hole and uh, they also looked at it with the, the very large array and there was some uh, radio emissions that also kind of indicated the same type of jet um, and it was pointing back to the, the supermassive black hole. So uh, kind of exciting. It, it's really very faint so uh, it, it's it's not something that's easily seen, easily detected, but um, um, they were pretty excited. I mean, uh, Chandra's been looking at uh, for this since 1999, so uh, uh, I think they were pretty excited that they actually saw something. And I think it's important to understand before people ask us this question, which is I thought nothing can come out of a black hole, that these jets are emanating from the environment around the black hole. So, you know, all this material tries to fall into the black hole. It gets caught up around, swirling around the black hole, and it gets very hot and a very complicated magnetic environment, and that can form these jets to pour out of the supermassive black hole. They're not actually coming from the black hole. Once you cross that event horizon, that matter is done for, but just outside the environment of the black hole, you can't get these jets that are that will pour out. So, right. um, cool. And that's like one of the most, uh, you know, some future civilization that could be the most efficient method of gaining energy is you just feed <laughs> a black hole, you let this energy get swirled up around it and give off mountains of high energy gamma radiation, and then you just scoop it up and enjoy a energy future. Um, okay, so I think we're just about wrapped up. There's one giveaway that we're doing this week, Nancy, and uh, and I think there's still a couple of days left, so people still people still have some time, right? 
Right. Yeah, we've got uh, the brand new 2014 uh, calendar, and I actually hang on a sec. Yeah. I haven't got one yet, and Jason had one last last week. So uh, I don't know if you guys gotten one, Nancy. No. Nancy's got yeah. one. David, have there you gotten is. seen this thing? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Yeah. That's awesome. Nice. Yep. It's really cool, and it's uh, it's just it's a huge calendar. It's got all these great pictures. Um, different different stuff every month. There's uh, biographies about different astronomers and people um, in space, and it's just it's just great. I love hanging having it on my wall because I can, uh, you know, there's something new every month, and there's all sorts of info, and of course there's room to write your own info. So it's a great uh, calendar. So we have a giveaway on Universe Today, um, five of them, and we'll probably have some more of these later. So. Uh, Feel free to uh, keep tabs. We'll uh, we'll have some more giveaways so as well. Then. So that's proof, Nancy, that Comet Ison isn't going to wipe us out in 2013. That the 2014 calendars are coming out. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. And so the giveaway goes um, <laughs> through Monday. To the 25th. Yeah. So you've got until the 25th. You come back to Universe today, and there's a link to that article, and you can go and just put in your email address and do a giveaway. Uh, and you might be amazed, but that was not an advertisement. So we actually don't charge them any money for, for doing the, these giveaways on Universe Today. We're trying yeah. to get a lot of giveaways, like space-related giveaways, on Universe Today, and we pretty much give away something every week almost. So this week we've got this, and we've put his feet to the fire. This is the year in space, and I think he's going to do a few more versions of this giveaway further along into the, to the end of the year. So yep. it's, a, it's a great opportunity to, to win a copy, and if you want, they're not that expensive either, like $12, oh. I think. Yeah. Yep. They're great. There uh, it is. Yeah, by... By the calendar for twelve ninety five. So there you go. Yeah, they're we, they're awesome. We we've been talking about MSL Frazier. I just put up an image real quick. I I came across this in my research, and I had actually never seen this picture before, of MSL upside down in the laboratory with its RTGs installed. There, those, those fin shaped things on the very back of it. There. So oh, I, I had right. never I had never seen that picture before. So I was like, <laughs> that's kind of cool. Uh, Amy, you were at NASA JPL uh, a year and a half ago, and you got, did you get a chance to see that full size model of Curiosity? The yeah, stand I have beside a it? picture of me not next to it because there was a velvet rope that you couldn't go beyond. But um, yeah, I, I, it was out there, and what was great was they had that, and they had uh, Spirit Opportunity, they had the uh, uh, Phoenix Lander. And Sojourner, which is my favorite because it's tiny, <laughs> so you get to, cool. it's great to see all these things full scale. That thing's massive. Yeah, it's no, it's so it's big. it is really a something to stand next to the yeah. Curiosity rover and realize that's, just how intimidating yeah. a, a machine I, it really is. That's what I heard everybody awesome. say. They said it's it's much bigger than they expected. Yeah, when they say I'm SUV jealous. size, they mean that. Yeah, I'm so. jealous. I never got to see it in person. When I saw it, it was inside its fairing already. So. <laughs> well, the, the, there's this full scale model at JPL. So so now you've oh, got cool. the excuse to go to NASA JPL. Cool. There's one at Arizona State University for anybody who happens to live in Phoenix. I don't You've know escaped. why they have one, but yes, I have. But I did get to see the full-scale model at ASU. It was, again, walking by it. It's just like in a lit window in the physics building or something. It's just sort of walking by. You're like, wow, that's a big rover. So just a couple of quick comments and questions from the from the audience. Uh, Alexander Howlett says, what could possibly be more inspirational than watching a married couple get a space divorce? <laughs> I, think, I think in the press conference, actually, I should have said this earlier because it's funny, that they talked about um, they would have someone like Dr. Drew on hand for marital counseling when things got rough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that that would There's... be that would that would definitely increase the publicity if things went south in the marriage yes. and they're stuck with another with each other for another five hundred days. That's the real uh, human factors gain is how people react when crammed in a tiny environment with That's their spouse. <laughs> be another good psychology experiment. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Hugo Burnham says, as Nicole Gallucci isn't here, I'll say it: black holes do not suck. So. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. <laughs> Um, uh, Yov Landsman says Apollo 8 wasn't supposed to go around the moon. They changed their plan to answer the Soviet Zond 5 mission that orbited around the moon with a cargo of animals. Yeah. Um, sort of. Sort of. It was it was spurred on slightly because um, yeah, Zond 5 went. I think it was in August. Um, and they had turtles and stuff around around the moon. But the the idea of maybe taking Apollo 8 into orbit was already on the books at NASA. It may, it may have been sort of 
you know, nudged a little bit by the Soviets, but it was it was more because of the state of the Apollo program. But yeah, it was it, there was a, a bit of a factor in there. Space turtles. <laughs> Space turtles. <laughs> uh, okay, so why don't we wrap this up then? We've sort of reached our hour. Amy, share a title. Where do we find out more from you? Um, Twitter is AST Vintage Space. Uh, Google Plus and Facebook as my name, and um, my blog is at Popular Science Vintage Space. And others, but just try those. <laughs> uh, Vice, Motherboard. Do I have to say this all oh, for you? Okay. Scientific uh, American stuff. Scientific Ars Technica. Okay. Uh, David Dickinson, where do we find out more? Uh, see, I've been active this week on Universe Today, Listasaur, Canada.com. I've been kind of lazy this week. It's, uh, the, the launch took out the first half of my week traveling to that. So. Aww, and, did you see a rocket launch and yeah. you get tired? <laughs> In person. Oh, yeah. Aww. And uh, let's see, what else? Oh, I'll probably be at the virtual star party soon. Sunday night, although I don't know if I'll have anything to... I think Jupiter's in, in, in range now, so I may be able to start bringing that. Fantastic. And and no stupid moon, so that'll be good. No. Uh, Nancy Atkinson. hate on the moon. Where, we hate the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy Atkinson, where do we find out more? Universe Today. You can find me there almost every day, and I'm active on Twitter at Nancy underscore A and Google Plus, and sometimes Facebook. Fantastic. All right. And of course, you can see some of my stuff on Universe Today. Uh, I'm doing lots of cool videos on YouTube. We've actually, we're going to be releasing, hopefully, uh, all of the interviews that we did down when we were in Los Angeles last week. So we've got a whole pile of really great interviews that are going to be coming out over the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and the next big thing we're going to do is the Virtual Star Party on Sunday night, uh, probably 6 o'clock Pacific time now. So Yay. we can definitely go earlier and earlier now. So we push it to time. five. Yeah, I think we'll push it to 5.30 next week or even 5. So, um, Cool. All right, well, thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks to the team for joining me this week. I really appreciate it, and we'll see all of you next week. Later. Bye. Bye.